Okay, in this video, I'm going to begin my derivation of the Fourier transform. I'm going to perform this derivation through a series of three videos. The first two videos will introduce all of the necessary theory required to derive the transform, and a third video will have the derivation of the transform proper. Specifically in this video, number one of three, I'm going to revise the Fourier series. And this is going to be pitched at a person who has seen Fourier series in the past and is just looking to brush up on the, the derivation of the Fourier series and what Fourier series are. Before I continue, I'd like to introduce to you my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed, and I also have a few other things which may be of interest. So let's begin. So, like I said, in order for us to derive the Fourier transform, we must begin at Fourier series. Joseph Fourier suggested that all 2 pi periodic functions have what's known as a Fourier series. And the Fourier series is of the form written on the bottom of your screen. I think it is useful for us just to read this as a beginning. So let's say we have a function of time, f of t. So the first thing we have in the Fourier series is a constant term, a0. Sometimes this is written as a0 over 2. Now this will just mean that the derivation of a0 will be slightly different, but it won't affect the results at all. We need to add to this the infinite power series, going from n is equal to 1 to infinity, of the coefficient a sub n multiplied by cosine nt, and the coefficient b sub n multiplied by sine nt. So this is what Fourier proposed. He thereafter had to work out or derive the actual functional forms of b sub n, a sub n, and a sub zero. So let's quickly show how he did that. In order to derive the a sub zero term, we multiply the Fourier series here by one and we integrate from minus pi to pi. So I've done that here. Now, well, I haven't really done it, I've more shown how it's done. Note that the, this set of terms here integrates to zero, and this term here integrates to twice pi. Rearranging, we get the functional form of a sub zero down here. Note, by the way, if we had defined the Fourier series as having a sub zero over two, well then this uh, scaling term would be slightly different. But of course, it would not affect your results. Now it's time to derive the functional form of a sub n. Before we do that, we require some revision. Sine and cosine are said to be orthogonal but in a mathematical rather than a geometrical sense. The definition mathematically of this is written here, whereby we integrate on the interval minus to positive pi, cosine mt by the sine of n or mt, and we get zero. Now, if we integrate the product of cosine mt and cosine nt, on that same interval, we get three different results. When m is not equal to n, we get zero. When m is equal to n and both are equal to zero, we get twice pi. And when m is equal to n and non-zero, we get pi. So this means that this integral pretty much will always be zero unless m equals n, and thereafter this integral becomes essentially the integral of cosine squared, and we get pi. Pretty much the same thing happens when we integrate the product of these signs, where we have m and n here like that. Once again, if it's done correctly, whereby m is equal to n, we integrating sine squared, and we get pi. The last thing we need is this double angle formula here. That is in order to integrate cosine squared and sine squared x. Just quickly, you can, you can look at my video on how to integrate cosine and sine squared x, but essentially what we do is we integrate, we'll say, cos squared plus sine squared, that's equal to one. Cos squared minus sine squared is equal to twice cos x, we'll say. If you add the two of those, 
you get the double angle formula for cosine squared in, t in terms of cosine 2x. And if you then substitute in sine squared is equal to 1 minus cos squared, you're able to get the formula I've written on the bottom of your screen.